When I left you last week, we were well on our way to a finished camera. This week, I can guarantee you we will be taking photos with this camera. So let's get to it. The camera I ordered actually came with a fairly decent ground glass, considering the age of the camera. Although the ground glass had seen better days, there was no scratches or anything like that, and it was fully functional. That being said, I had recently practiced and learnt the art of making my own ground glass when I accidentally broke the ground glass on my Chroma 617. Whilst I was waiting for the replacement, which I'd ordered uh, directly from Chroma cameras, I thought, well, this is a learning experience, why don't I see if I can make my own? So, after several failed attempts at cutting the glass to the correct size, it seems to be one area I'm still not very good at, is cutting glass precisely and having it crack on the line correctly and not shatter in random pieces, I was able to get a piece of ground glass that fit the camera. Then, using the 600 grit that I had purchased, um, I was able to produce a ground glass fairly quickly um, that was much brighter and uh, the uh, crispness of the image was significantly better than the existing ground glass that came with the camera. I'd originally planned to just mark out the 617 frame lines onto the ground glass, allowing me to see above and below um, uh, the image if I wanted to, so I could just, you know, it would make reframing shots slightly easier. I found using rangefinder cameras that having the ability to see around your frame is actually quite useful. And, you know, especially when you're shooting quickly, being able to see what's outside of your frame uh, of what your lens is seeing, but being able to move and adjust to that has always been incredibly useful. However, when I started sort of mocking that up with a view camera, I found it was maybe it's the fact that, you know, view cameras are flipped upside down and horizontal, uh, flipped left and right. I was having trouble visualizing the 617 frame when I could see the top and the bottom. So instead, I decided to mask off the top and bottom of frames so I would only see the 617. The important thing is, because I hadn't altered the original ground glass, uh, it would be a very simple thing if I ever wanted to go back to shooting half plate, for instance, I could just remove my ground glass and pop in another ground glass that doesn't have the masking on it. So it's very simple, well, fairly simple, to switch between, say, half plate and 617, or in fact, any format. If I wanted to create a plate for a 4x5, for instance, I could make a viewing screen specifically for that. So, using some uh, automotive vinyl, I masked off the, very, the top and bottom of frame so that I could see exactly what the 617 image would see. For the film counter, um, I was originally going to do what pretty much every other 3D printed uh, view camera has done and just print off a little tiny little shutter that would uh, block the little window, allowing me to see what frame number I was up to. But one day I was uh, using my laptop and I looked up and I noticed that my uh, privacy slider that I have for my webcam was almost perfectly the same size as your standard window uh, for a frame viewer, uh, for a frame counter on a view camera. So I ordered one of those and lo and behold, I was able to drill a hole straight through the film back uh, for my uh, frame counter and then simply glue the little privacy slider for a uh, webcam over that. And I have a very nicely, very precise little slidey little window that looks significantly better than anything I could have 3D printed. When deciding to make this camera, there was two areas that really kind of worried me. One was the film plane, getting it exactly precise so that the film would be sitting at the exact point that it needed to be for focus. Being that this is the first camera I've ever effectively built, I don't know how much wiggle room I've got. The other area that was really gonna concern me was light leaks. That is a, a point of failure with pretty much every camera that has a removable back. I needed to be able to reliably remove and add and remove and add dark slide to this camera back with zero light leaks at any stage. Um, and so I thought, well, what am I gonna do here? This is an area that I, I definitely can't do myself. I can't 3D print a dark slide. And I live in an apartment. I don't have room for tools really, so I can't do any metal work. So I can't do that myself. So my th original thought was, well, I'll mock up and design my dark slide and that will be something I'll send off to PCB Way or something like that. The cost to get one piece of aluminum cut and shipped to Australia was a lot. And it was so much that I thought, maybe there is a way I can do this myself. Worst case scenario, I have that as a backup option, but maybe there's a way I can do it myself. So I did what I normally do got on eBay, found pieces of spring steel that were slightly larger than I needed, and I ordered a sheet. So after sort of leaving that sheet of spring steel on my desk for probably two weeks, I decided I'll give it a go. 
What's the worst that can happen? I clamped the piece of spring steel onto a piece of timber with another piece of metal on top of it as a straight line. And then with my best friend, the Dremel, I very carefully ran the cutoff wheel up and down the line, very slowly, very precisely, but without trying to cut through in one go. And after quite some time, I had what was within plus or minus half a millimeter, a perfectly straight edge. Sliding into my test pieces, I was incredibly surprised that not only did it fit perfectly, but I'd actually worked out my tolerances almost perfectly from the first go. I did end up tweaking my print ever so slightly later on when I added in some, um, some felt edging and, and so on around the edges just to increase the chance of, of trapping any of those light leaks. But for the most part, it was actually a fairly simple process. One thing I knew I was going to have to do was to alter the front standard to support a standardized uh, Linhof lens board. The spacing around uh, is very similar to the size of, of a Linhof, but just off. It is a little bit taller, but it's, it's not as wide as a Linhof lens board. Uh, so once again, placed the lens board in there and found exactly where I needed to, and using my best friend, the Dremel, I was able to trim out just a little bit of the timber either side so that the lens, the Linhof lens board would sit in quite nicely. Now, as far as the vertical movement, there was too much there. Um, I was able to 3D print a uh, insert that was the exact same size as the Linhof with the little gaps and adjustments on the bottom that the Linhof sort of clips into. And then I was able to just then move the, uh, the bottom plate up by about two millimeters uh, and tap new holes there. And the Linhof now clips in perfectly and, and, and latches in with the top latch as if it was, that's how it was designed. Um, I used some uh, wood uh, filler to fill the two, three little holes uh, where the bottom metal plate used to be. The last step, although not technically necessary, was something I really wanted to do. The camera has obviously seen many years of use and so I was looking a little tired. I decided I wanted to clean up the camera as much as I could without altering the entire thing. And so I wanted to uh, at least polish all of the bright work, all the metal on the camera. So I removed a couple of pieces of the metal work from the camera and gave a go at polishing it using, once again, my good friend the Dremel with a polishing wheel attachment. Very quickly I found that some Brasso with the Dremel brought the metal work back to a bright shining silver very quickly. So I removed every single piece of the camera that was made of metal and polished it with Brasso and the Dremel and it came back amazing, all bright and looking as fresh as it came out of the shop. I also decided to replace every single screw in the camera because they're all, among other things, they were not Phillips head, they were flat head, which is quite possibly the most annoying uh, screw head ever to, uh, to remove. So, and also they were all looking a little rusted and old. So I replaced all of the screws throughout the camera. Um, all of the metal was repolished and then replaced on the camera. And the timber, whilst I could have probably sanded down and then revarnished or whatever, I decided to leave as is. I kind of liked the distressed look there. Um, but with the, all of the touch surfaces, all the metal that you would actually use on the camera, um, all polished up and looking bright, the camera looked a lot better. I also took the opportunity to re-grease the little uh, cam mechanisms on the camera so that when focusing either the front or the rear standard back and forth, um, you didn't get that squeak that you tend to get with a lot of view cameras. So putting all the components together, I finally had what I felt was a workable film back. The camera was ready, the lenses were ready, I was ready. This is not going to be a shot that I'm going to care about. I don't want to put any effort into this, especially if it doesn't work. So there was a bridge that I run past on my run every day. Being that it's literally five minutes drive from my house, it was perfect. Not only that, but the bridge, the view of the bridge has lots of detail in the foreground, the midground, and the, and, and the background. Lots of different little elements, very small elements and so on, that I felt would be useful for testing purposes for me able to see where focus was, where how sharp the image was, were there any uh, limitations there. So I brought the camera out and set up my first shot. I decided I was going to be shooting effectively three frames. The first frame was going to be shooting with my 135mm lens, which I know quite well and I've used and I, I feel comfortable using decided to shoot that at f16 which generally seems to be the uh, the f-stop that I, I have found is the best for this this lens and bring, gives me images that I'm really happy with. I was then going to use my new lens the 90 millimeter lens at the exact same settings so the same framing same settings f16 uh, so that way I can compare the two lenses but also I can see if there's any differences between them. My third image was going to be an incredibly interesting image I was going to not shoot an image 
So to test to see if there were any even slight light leaks that perhaps might get hidden by the actual exposed images, my third image, I would literally set the camera up as if I was taking a photo, I would take the dark slide out, wait 10 seconds, slide the dark slide back in and wind on. Waste of a perfectly good frame, but I felt that this way, if there are any light leaks that perhaps just are every slightly around the edges or something like that, that might get hidden by an exposed frame, I might be able to see it on this frame. My final image, which I would shoot back at home, I wanted to see how good it was at close focus. So for my final image, I shot at a 5.6, which is the widest the F135 can go. And I shot as close to the camera as possible, which from memory, I think is about 180 centimeters, something like that, um, of a focusing chart to see how, how sharp the image is with the lens completely stopped down. Once I'd finished shooting the rolls of film, dropped them off to my film developer and then waited with bated breath. And here's the first image. Uh, this is straight out of Silverfast. Um, I didn't put any sharpening on the image and, or any colour correction for that matter. Um, all I've done is crop it um, because I just wanted to see the image as it were. Um, and straight out of the gate, it looks really good. Um, the best example would be if we zoom in on the point that I actually focused on, which was this red light um, off in the distance. So this is at 100%. Keeping in mind this is uh, gold 200, which is quite a grainy film. You can see that, uh, yeah, it's, it's sharp as far as it can be considering the distance um, and definitely in focus. If we scroll all the way down to the bottom of the frame, which is the closest point, you can see it's resolving all of the stones there and so on. Um, going up further a little bit up here, you can see we're definitely uh, getting everything that we were expecting to get. If I scroll over to the edge here, all the way to the edge, there we are. Um, once again, it's, there's basically no distortion. Um, the amount of detail is just amazing. And whilst it probably can be kind of hard to, to judge, you know, how close up we are, but as an example, let's say, like here, this was it Nans or whatever this, this particular piece of uh, graffiti is. If we zoom out, Now you can see that was all the way in that area there. So you can sort of see the level of resolution we're getting from you know, Gold 200, which is not really the, uh, the sharpest uh, uh, film to begin with. So this is with a 135, a lens that I know fairly well. Then I exposed another frame uh, using my new 90 millimeter. Now there's a slight color cast change, don't know if that's, you know, uh, silver fast is kind of weird how it does auto colouring and so on. Um, but in terms of uh, the actual image itself, um, as you can see, it was exactly the same camera setup. I just swapped, swapped the lenses over. Both were shot at f16. Once again, if I zoom in all the way to 100%, um, we can see our point that we focused on. Um, obviously, being that it's a wider lens, um, the image is a little bit softer um, because we are getting a lot more uh, information into the frame. But once again, if I focus, scroll down to the bottom here, um, you can see still resolving the stones, um, still re re resolving all of the, the uh, pipes and so on there. If we jump across to our little piece of, uh, where was it? Somewhere up here from memory. Uh, graffiti. Where was that graffiti? Oh, there it is. Still visible, still fairly, um, uh, legible. Um, there, I did notice that there is, especially on the 90, it is, I'll just zoom out a little bit here, it is a little bit, there's a little bit of distortion on the edge of frame. Um, it still looks pretty good here, but as you can see, just on the edges, there is a bit of distortion. And once again, up in the trees, I feel it's a little bit more distorted. Honestly, I feel that that's probably more a limitation of the lens. You can sort of see the buildings sort of distorting in the distance there as well. This is probably a limitation of a 90mm lens versus, which is a fairly wide lens um, on this uh, film size, um, versus comparing it to actually saying that there's any distortion um, on the frame. Um, also, you can see um, it's from edge to edge, it is a very um, well formed image. So I'm fairly sure that the film plane is flat and is exactly where I was expecting it to be. I'm going to jump across to the third frame now. 
uh, sorry, the second frame, there we are, third frame. Um, this was my um, focus test. So what I did is um, I set up the camera at the closest focusing for the 135 lens, which from memory I think is about a 180, 190 centimeters. Um, away from the camera, I put a little focusing chart and I focused on it and shot at 5.6. Um, I very rarely ever actually shoot at 5.6. Um, I've shot it once and I didn't like the image, so I pretty much always shoot um, f16, something like that. But this was a good test just to see how the focusing works. So once again, as you can see, I focused on this point here and we can sort of see from the texture of the plastic here, definitely in focus and just off in the distance further from that, uh, the, because the unit, this unit is actually on a slight angle, um, we're seeing some focus loss. You can sort of see in the carpet here, it's probably about that point where we're sort of getting, getting a bit softer. Because I'm an idiot, um, I didn't actually put the uh, focus tester in the middle of the carpet, so it's kind of hard to see um, the foreground, but the foreground seems to be uh, a little bit sharper for a little bit longer. So as you can see, we've got about this much distance um, that is sharp versus from this one, the distance seems to be less. So I'm probably possibly focused more the, the lens, even though I focus at this point, is probably sharpest maybe at the four or the five, which look, considering the uh, size of the frame and considering um, that we're working with, you know, uh, 3D printed and, and possibly a hundred year old camera, tolerances are pretty good. And when we zoom out to the full size image, you can see that uh, having it off by what, possibly a centimeter is pretty damn good for um, for a camera that age and for you know, a homemade film back. Now comes the interesting one, the uh, light leak test. Now, when I developed the film, or got the film developed and I pulled it out, I could just make out an ever so slight light leak. Um, when I scanned it in, um, I actually had to push silver fast uh, curves manually just for it to even resolve the light leak. Um, and then what I've done is I've brought it into Photoshop and I've actually put some curves on it so we can actually see it. Now this looks quite scary, but keeping in mind, this is not what it looks like um, on the frame. I've just pushed this far so I can actually see it and try and figure out what's happening. Um, you'll see I've also with a Sharpie written uh, top, bottom, right and left was over here, um, just so that I know where the film was actually on the camera so I can figure out where the light would have been coming from. So as you can see, we've got a what you, your standard sort of kind of light leak here, which kind of makes sense that somewhere in the top left hand corner of the camera, there was a very small gap and light was coming through there. Interestingly enough, the dark slide is on this side. So the side with the dark slide basically is, is there's nothing. Uh, the side that doesn't have the dark slide, uh, which one theoretically would think is, is still better, has a slight ingress of light there. And then at the base, we've got this weird situation where there's light coming out here, which makes sense. And it's sort of spreading off in that distance, makes sense. But then on the left-hand side, there's this sort of black period portion. So somehow the light's being stopped from there and spreading around it. So I'm not exactly sure how that works. And there's also this kind of lens flare effect here. So I, I would love to hear if anybody has any suggestions of where they think the light leak is coming from. Because looking at the camera, I have very, very closely looked at everything at the base of the camera, every at the base of the film plate, uh, the bellows, everything, there is not a single amount of light coming through. Um, you can't see it on the frame here, but actually on the negative itself, um, under here obviously, which is where the frame numbers are exposed, they're perfectly exposed. So the light leak is uh, is not affecting those. So which means that that tells us the light leak is post film back uh, because the film back is blocking that part of the film. So no, no light is getting to it and it's exposing perfectly. So post so after the film back heading towards the lens is where the film leak, the light leak theoretically is happening. Looked everywhere, cannot find a light leak. My gut feeling is if there is a light leak, it's in the bellows because that's my least favorite part about the camera. But I have looked and I've spent quite a lot of time with a torch, you know, with a dark bag jammed over my head and cannot find anything. So if anybody has any ideas, now the important point about this is this, Looking at this light leak here, you would think, okay, even a small amount of light leak is going to be an issue. Jumping across to this image here, there is no light leak at all visible in the image. If we jump across to this again, top left hand corner, there should be at least something showing. So if we zoom out, top left hand corner, not even the slightest hint of a light leak. And this is on all the frames. So I'm not exactly sure what's going on. Um, 
I'd love to fix it. If there's a way I can expose a perfectly black frame, um, I will. Um, but at the moment, uh, the images seem to be sharp. The film plate seems to be nice and flat. Um, and so I'm really happy with the results. And there you have it. After a lot of work, and I have to say, a lot of fun, I've been able to produce a film back for a view camera to shoot 617 frames for not a lot of money. Now, I know a lot of people are going to ask me how much did it end up costing? And the number's kind of hard to actually come up with. The hard costs, generally, I know. So the actual camera itself off eBay was about $200 plus shipping, Australian. Um, the components that I had to buy, such as the knobs for the film winder, um, hardware, all of those bits and pieces total probably $50. Um, the bellows, which, let's see, split into two. The homemade bellows, I probably spent on material and the plans and the designs and so on, $50, $60 Australian. Um, Pre-made bellows ordered from uh, overseas to be uh, handmade bellows. They're gonna cost, I think they're about $180 Australian. So significantly more than the, the homemade ones, but still not a heck of a lot uh, when you think the grand scheme of things. So realistically, oh, and 3D printing. Um, I bought a brand new 3D printer to be able to do this, to be able to fit everything on the bed. Um, but if you take that aside, because if you if you're into 3D printing, you probably have a 3D printer. Um, I probably spent maybe thirty dollars, maybe forty dollars in um, filament. So realistically, if we'd add it all together, two hundred, probably in the realm of three to four hundred dollars Australian, which in US dollars is probably about twelve. Um, no, realistically, it's probably about 200 US, give or take. Um, and then my time, which obviously I think you should value your time and you know my time is valuable, your time is valuable, but we'll set that aside um, because realistically also um, there is the entertainment value. You know, the amount of time I, I spent, I was enjoying doing it. So I consider that entertainment. So realistically, um, I spent probably about $400 Australian to produce this camera compared to four and a half thousand Australian for a Shenhao, um, compared to if I was to buy a Graflock back, a Intrepid, and uh, for um, my existing uh, Chroma back, film back, what, let's say a thousand dollars maybe, a bit more. Um, all in all, pretty good investment. So yeah, I think that if you're into 3D printing, if you're into film photography, uh, something I would highly recommend you do. Yes, it's going to take a while, uh, but I think you will learn a lot on the way, and I definitely have learned a lot on the way. Um, and the very first thing it's done for me is, is already I'm looking at other things that I can create. What are some other tools that I would like that I currently don't have? Perhaps I can build them myself. So that's it. So until the next video, say hi to your dog for me. <laughs>